Hello, everyone. If you take your Bibles, we're going to be looking at Matthew chapter 27. Matthew chapter 27. We're going to be looking at verses 20 or 32 through 54. Matthew in chapter 27. Verse number 32 says, And as they came out, they found a man of Cyrene, Simon by name. Him they compelled to bear his cross. And when they were come unto a place called Golgotha, that is to say, a place of a skull, they gave him vinegar to drink mingled with gall, and when he had tasted thereof, he would not drink. And they crucified him and parted his garments, casting lots, that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken by the prophet. They parted my garments among them, and upon my vesture did they cast lots. And sitting down, they watched him there, and set up over his head his accusation written, This is Jesus, the King of the Jews. Then were there two thieves crucified with him, one on the right hand and another on the left. And they that passed by reviled him, wagging their heads and saying, Thou that destroyest the temple and buildest it in three days, save thyself, if thou be the Son of God, and come down from the cross. Likewise also the chief priests mocking him with the scribes and elders said, He saved others himself, he cannot save. If he be the king of Israel, let him now come down from the cross, and we will believe him. He trusted in God, let him deliver him now, if he will have him, for he said, I am the son of God. The thieves also, which were crucified with him, cast the same in his teeth. Now from the sixth hour there was darkness over all the land unto the ninth hour. And about the ninth hour, Jesus cried with a loud voice, saying, Eli, Eli, lama thabachthani, that is to say, My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Some of them that stood there, when they heard that, said, This man called for Elias. And straightway one of them ran and took a sponge, and filled it with vinegar, and put it on a reed, and gave him to drink. The rest said, Let be, let us see whether Elias will come to save him. Jesus, when he, heard, when he had cried again with a loud voice, yielded up the ghosts. And behold, the veil of the temple was rent in twain from top to bottom, and the earth did quake, and the rocks rent. And the graves were opened, and many bodies of the saints which slept arose, and came out of the graves after his resurrection, and went into the holy city, and appeared unto many. Now when the centurion and they that were with him, watching Jesus, saw the earthquake and those things that were done, they feared greatly, saying, Truly, this was the Son of God. Let's open up in prayer. Dear and Father, we thank you for this day. Lord, we thank you for all that you've done for us. And we thank you for the opportunity to be in your word. Lord, Lord, I just pray that you'd help me as I, as I preach this sermon, Lord. I pray that you'd give me the words to say. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. As you read the crucifixion account, what do you think of? What do you see in your mind's eye? Is this just another Bible account that you've read or heard of before? So you don't really think about it. Are there any emotions that get stirred up inside of you as you read this account? Do you see the mob of people, the darkened sky, the broken body of Christ? Is the account new every time you read it? Is there any sense of sadness, grief, pain, or conviction? Do we have any idea at all of what Jesus went through when he was placed on the cross? The answer is no. We really have no clue as to the physical nor spiritual suffering that Christ endured when he was on the cross. Though we can gain some insight of his sacrifice and suffering by going through the events. The events. First event is they crucified him. If we read the whole chapter, we would see how he was betrayed, falsely accused, falsely convicted, beaten and mocked all before he was placed on the rugged cross. He was mockingly accused of being king of the Jews. The full inscription, as given by the four Gospels, read, This is Jesus of Nazareth, the King of the Jews. You see, when Jesus was betrayed in the garden, he was brought before a false trial. It was a farce trial. Six times he was brought into different trials before they finally convicted him. And then, when he was finally convicted, and, and Pilate gave him to the Jews, the Roman soldiers prior to, prior to leading him out of the garrison beat him savagely. They placed the crown of thorns on his head and they whipped him until 
One commentator said he came out looking like one giant bruise, one giant lesion. And then finally he was turned over and then he was marched to the cross where the nails were placed in his hands and feet and he was set up in its place. And he was mocked and he was accused. He marched down the street with the inscription, This is Jesus of Nazareth, the King of the Jews. Now this upset the Jews because that's, they said this is what he claimed to be. But Pilate put that he is the King of the Jews. Mark 15, verse 32 says, Let Christ, the King of Israel, descend now from the cross, that we may see and believe. The account in Mark is, a, is, a, is, is parallel with this passage, and it, it shows how they mocked him. How the, how the chief priests were mocking him and calling him to come down. Let him come down from the cross. Let him descend now that we may see and believe. What these chief priests and these scribes and these elders didn't realize at the moment when they were mocking Christ is that he very well could have come down from the cross. He had that power to come down. He was not powerless against them nor the cross. John 18, 4 through 6 says, Jesus therefore, knowing all things that should come upon him, went forth and said unto them, Whom seek ye? They answered him, Jesus of Nazareth. Jesus said unto them, I am he. And Judas also, which betrayed him, stood with them. And as, as, soon, as, as soon then as he had said unto them, I am he, they went backwards and fell to the ground. You see, the very words of Christ had power. Just as words had power. The God who created the universe with his words, when he spoke and told them, the mob who came against him, when he said, I am he, they fell backwards from the power of his words. Matthew 26, 53 says, Thinkest thou that I cannot now pray to my Father, and he shall presently give me more than twelve legions of angels? Now we might not fully understand how, 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 how mighty of a force twelve legions would have been. But if, if, you, if you think back in the time, at this present time, or around this time, the Roman Empire had 24 active legions. These active legions had roughly 5,000 to 6,000 um, legionnaires and accessory units that were either half or equal to that same force, of either non-Roman non citizens or just servants and extra personnel. But also, there was only two legions in Israel at the time. One was stationed there in Jerusalem, and another was stationed in and around the, the Galilee area. So Christ said, presently, he, may, he, he can give me more than twelve legions of angels. Twelve legions. He said, presently, half of the might of the Roman Empire can be here for me. That would have outnumbered the legions in Jerusalem six to one. It was a mighty force that Jesus said presently can be given to me. He had that power. He had the ability to call down to protect him. He told Peter this when he told Peter to put his sword away. Because he didn't need Peter to protect him. He had protection. He just didn't want it. He didn't need it. Another pain that Christ went through is that God had forsaken him. Imagine this. I really don't think we can. But the very same God that has promised never to leave us or forsake us turned his back on his only begotten son. When the weight of the sin of the entire world was placed on Christ's shoulders, God turned his back on Jesus Christ. He turned his back on the Son. He turned his back on the deity, on, on, on one of the Trinity, up on, on God Himself. He turned his back because of that sin. He forsook Him. I think that is one of the greatest pains that Christ felt at that moment, was to be forsaken. He cried out. He said, why hast thou forsaken me? He felt that pain in that moment. It was a physical and spiritual pain that Jesus felt at that time. You see, another thing that Christ went through at the time is 
Men did not grieve for their Savior. If you look back at verses 48 and 49 of chapter 27, verses 48 and 49, and straightway one of them ran and took a sponge and filled it with vinegar and put it on a reed and gave him to drink. The rest said, Let be. Let us see whether Elias will come to save him. They had no pity for this man on the cross. They had no sorrow for him. They did not mourn. They did not grieve this man who they did not know, but he was paying the price for their sin. They did not grieve their Savior. But because of their lack of grief, earth grieved for its creator. If you'll turn over to John, John in chapter 19. Turn over to John in chapter 19, and we read in verse 30. Verse 30 says, When Jesus therefore had received the vinegar, he said, It is finished. And he bowed his head and gave up the ghost. He gave up the ghost at that time. It was finished. He had paid the penalty. He had suffered. And so he gave up the ghost. Back in Matthew 27, in verses 50 through 54, Jesus, it says, Jesus, when he had cried again with a loud voice, that cry was, it is finished. When he cried again with a loud voice, yielded up the ghost. And behold, the veil of the temple was rent in twain from the top to the bottom. And the earth did quake, and the rocks rent, and the graves were opened, and many bodies of the saints which slept arose, and came out of the grave after his resurrection, and went into the holy city, and appeared unto many. Now when the centurion and they that were with him watching, Jesus saw the earthquake, and those, that, and those things that were done, they feared greatly, saying, Truly, this was the Son of God. So yet this moment, earth grieved for its creator. It's the temple veil. We see this, the temple veil was rent in twain. Now this wasn't something that could be easily done. Exodus 26, 31 says, And thou shalt make a veil of blue and purple and scarlet and fine twined linen of cunning work with cherubims shall it be made. Arsenian ben Gamaliel said, the thickness of the veil is a hand's breadth, breadth, and it is woven of 72 threads, and every thread has 24 threads in it. It is 40 cubits long and 20 broad. This was a big veil to be rent. It was not done by any man. This rending was not done by any natural force. It was a supernatural force that rent this veil in two. And it was rent from top to bottom, so that it could not be said that somebody went underneath and started tearing it from the bottom. But even if somebody had tried to do that, it could not be done. You think a hand's breadth. That was a very thick piece of material that separated the holy from the holy of holies. And this, when Christ gave up the ghost, was rent in two. One commentator said that it was as if Christ, the great high priest, entered the temple upon his death and tore the veil in two to offer his own blood as a last atonement for sin, the forerunner for his people opening the throne of God so that we could now enter boldly in. You see, when Christ died, he had paid the penalty for the sin. He had offered the final sacrifice. There was no need anymore for the atoning blood upon, upon, the, the, beam, uh, upon the mercy seat. And so, upon his death, the veil was rent in twain, signifying that that was no longer needful. That, that, that holy place before God, the throne of God, was now available to all his children to come boldly before the throne of God. Boldly before the throne of God. That's what that was signifying. And personally, I like, I like the rocks. I like, I like how the Bible says that the rocks were, were rent. They split in two. They were rent open. You see, this word rent here is the same. It, it, it comes from the word used when, when we read in the Bible that one rents his clothes, one tears his clothes. This rent means to split or sever, to break, divide, open, rent, or make a rent. You see, personally, I think that when it says the rocks rent, if you remember the triumphal entry on Passover from Luke 19 to 19, 39 to 40, the Bible says there, and some of the Pharisees from among the multitude said unto him, Master, rebuke thy disciples. And he answered and said unto them, I tell you, 
that if these should hold their peace, the stones would immediately cry out. You see, when I see these rocks tearing in two, I, I, I imagine earth grieving for its creator because no man grieved its, their savior. And because of this lack of grief, the very earth grieved and the rocks tore themselves in half. They were rent in twain, just like if no man would have cried out, if no man would shout, if, if man would hold their peace, the rocks, the stones would cry out. I, th I think there's a similarity there. I, th I think that because of this lack of pity, lack of mourning, earth grieved its creator. And then there's the earthquake. You see there that there was an earthquake during this whole thing, and the earth did quake. Now, it's very interesting. We don't need science to prove the Bible, but it's interesting when science does show that the Bible is true, when, it does, when the Bible does agree, or when science does agree with the Bible. But they can go back to the Dead Sea because it's dead. There, there is no flowing out. There is, there is no stirring of the sediment in the Dead Sea. They can look back at the Dead Sea and they can see where the sediment has been disturbed. They can see when something occurred. They can, they can track the earthquakes in this region by looking at the sediment layers in the Dead Sea. And they, they know that around this time, around 33 to 35 AD, there was a great earthquake at that time. They know that from looking at the sediment layers in the Dead Sea. You see, when Christ gave up the ghost, it was a great event. It was a supernatural event. And supernatural powers shook the very earth. And though man, and though the, the very people that Christ came to refused him, there was a Roman that realized the truth. If you look in verse 54, it says, Now when the centurion and they that were with him watching, Jesus saw the earthquake and those things that were done, they feared greatly, saying, truly, this was the Son of God. You see, this Roman centurion had seen people crucified. Doubtless, he had crucified many himself. He had been a part of those details. He, he had been a part of those who, who marched him out of the garrison, who, who nailed him to the cross, who set the cross up. He had seen men die. And when he saw Christ die, he knew that was no man. He knew there was something different about this man. He knew this man was innocent. He saw the powers that took place when this happened. He saw the darkness in the sky for three hours. In the midday, when the sun should be shining bright, he saw the darkness. He realized that there was something different about this man. And once you realize that all this Jesus endured to pay for the sin of the world, to give you and me away, in which we can turn from our sin and be with him for all eternity. He faced excruciating physical stress in the garden, where he, sweat, he was sweating blood. He faced excruciating, excruciating pain at the hands of the Romans. But worst of all, he endured unimaginable pain, spiritual pain, that we will never have to face as believers, as being forsaken by God our Father. F.B. Meyer said, as our Lord descended into the valley of death, he breathed his departing spirit into the Father's hands. He knew that the path of life would unfold before him. He knew that the Father's welcome awaited him. And God did not fail him. However low he went, when he descended into Hades, the everlasting arms were always beneath him. And him did God raise up, having loosed the pangs of death, because it was not possible that he should be holden of it. So what does this mean? What does all this mean? Why should this matter to us? Well, as a Christian, after seeing what Christ did for you, what have you done for him? Can I ask you this question? How should we live our lives after reading this? How much should we be willing to sacrifice for Christ after he sacrificed himself? For us. What sacrifice is too great after what Christ gave? When you look back at your life and you, and you look back what, what kind of things that you might have to give up, certain people that you have to quit being in their company, certain things you have to relinquish and all this, and you think it's a great sacrifice to your life and your lifestyle, 
Is it anything compared to what Jesus Christ went through? Is that sacrifice really anything? Our lives are but a fleeting moment. And the things that we do here only matter if they can be put forward into eternity. The treasures we lay up here on earth are nothing. They will mold and they will pass away. It is only the treasures that are laid up in heaven that last for eternity. So are your sacrifices really sacrifices in light of what Christ did? Sage Spurgeon said, When the town is on fire, our house cannot be too far from the flames. When the plague is abroad, a man cannot be too far from its haunts. The further from a viper, the better, and the further from worldly conformity, the better. To all true believers, let the trumpet call be sounded. Come ye out from among them, be ye separate. I think this is very, very fitting in the time that, we, that we're in right now. And, and with, with the coronavirus and all this going on and everybody separating themselves and, and, and being quarantined and, and, and limiting interaction. You see, I think right now in everybody's minds, we can't be too far away from this virus. We can't be too far away from all that's happening. Believer, do you separate yourself from sin as much as you are separating yourself from this worldly virus that really doesn't hinder any, anything? Paul said, for me to live is Christ and to die is gain. So as much as you are separating and then quarantining yourself, how much more should you quarantine your temple, the temple which is of God, from sin? How much should you sacrifice to live a more Christian life? And then to an unbeliever, where are you? Can you see the enormous love that God had for you, that he gave his only begotten son to die such a death for men such as you? Can you truly ignore everything that Christ gave up, all that Christ sacrificed to give a lending hand to you that you might be able to escape an eternity in hell? What are you going to do this week different than last week? How are you going to look at what you do? Are you doing it for God or for yourself? There was a book written in 1896 and it's called In His Steps. And the whole point of the book is, is to try to get across to believers to take a moment and think before they act. To take a moment and ask a question of themselves. What would Jesus do in this situation? What would Jesus do here? What would Jesus do? As Christians, as little Christs, we should ask this question of ourselves every day, every moment of the day, every decision we have to make. How would Christ respond to this? How would Jesus respond to this? What would he do here? What would he have me do? It's really how we should live our Christian life. We should really live our Christian life completely ignoring our own personal desires and our own personal needs and, and solely focus on what should I do today? What, should, what does Christ want me to do today? Is there a new way you can look at Bible accounts? Is there a new way that you can look at Scripture when you read it? Do you see the events that are transpiring when you read the Bible? Just here in, this, in, in this, this crucifixion account, you can read so many historians and commentators that, that really delve into here and, and, really under, and really look at the historical records of how brutal this kind of torture was. It has been said many, many times, this is the most excruciating pain a human being can go through before they die. This was also the most humiliating death that a human, human being could go through. Do you need to check your heart to see why you have no emotion when reading God's word? And finally, are you prepared to sacrifice for Christ? Romans 12.1 says, I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that ye present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. Are you prepared to sacrifice for Christ? Are you prepared to give back to Jesus Christ? Are you prepared to give back to God? And then are you prepared to live a life 
that when it is done, you can be told, well done, thou good and faithful servant. Unbeliever. Can you ask yourself this question today, where am I going to go when I die? Do you have a peace in your heart? Do you, do you know? Do you know what Christ did for you? Do you know that there, is a sac that there was a sacrifice made for your sin? Do you know that the penalty has been paid? There's a free gift given to you. And all you have to do is accept. All this Christ gave for you. What can you give in return? What sacrifices are your reasonable service? Let's close in prayer. Dear and Father, Lord, we thank you for this day. Lord, we thank you for, for your word, Lord. And Lord, we thank you for, for what you did for us on the cross, Lord. Lord, we thank you that you came down from your throne, Lord, to live a life amongst us and to face that excruciating pain and death on the cross, Lord. Lord, I thank you that you rose again on the third day, Lord, that you conquered the grave. Lord, I thank you for the gift of salvation that you've given to us. In Jesus' name, amen.